Good afternoon, everyone. This is Olga Redding with Iowa Organic Association. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator for IOA. Uh, welcome to our winter webinar series. Uh, the webinar that we are hosting and doing today is Economics of Soil Health Systems with Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Rieke. And um, we are anticipating a pretty large crowd uh, so if you guys could please mute yourself, that would be great. Uh, what I'd like to do is I would like to ask you to just type in your questions in the chat box as they come in. And once uh, Liz is done uh, presenting at the end of our meeting, we'll kind of have a Q&A uh, session where I'm asking the questions that have come in. Um, and uh, yes, thank you everybody for being here today. So uh, prior to Liz uh, sharing her uh, slides, I will actually share a few slides about IOA and our mission so you guys can uh, become familiar with what we do as an organization. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll give you a quick uh, background on Dr. Riki. Um, she um, uh, works with Soil Health uh, uh, Institute uh, and her work primarily focuses on how adopt adoption soil health management practices affect soil, soil microbial structure and function. Uh, in addition, she is leading the Institute's effort to develop microbially derived indicators of soil health. Um, so, and, and Liz can definitely add to that as well. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Audrey uh, Tran Lam with Center for Energy and Environmental Education with the University of Nor Northern Iowa. So Audrey, thank you for sponsoring this webinar. And for those of you that have come in, um, please go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, I'll try to mute everybody too. Uh, we, we just wanna uh, make sure that uh, we don't have a lot of background noise. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and share my presentation quick and then uh, Liz will do her presentation. So just a moment. All righty. So uh, for... For those that don't know who we are, um, Iowa Organic Association is a nonprofit organization that was established in um, 2006 and, oops, and we are committed to education, advocacy, and uh, community cooperation. Our mission is to advance organic agriculture and food systems in Iowa. And our members represent a diverse community of farmers, gardeners, um, businesses, and advocates and consumers that support the organic movement. And you guys are part of this community, so we're pre appreciative of each and every one of you. As far as our priorities, these are our overarching priorities, um, education, outreach, advocacy, and community, and I'll touch a little bit on each one of them. As far as education, uh, we provide a variety of programs uh, and we share expertise uh, to help expand and diversify organic opportunities in Iowa. A few of the things that we have been involved that we have done over the years are um, these growing organic expertise workshops that have been geared towards technical service providers, folks uh, like in our NRCS and FSA. Um, in addition, we've also partnered with REAP SEP and have administered growing organic expertise in colleges across Iowa. And last fall, uh, myself and an organic farmer in each specific area where the college is located uh, provided lectures to students uh, in 10 different colleges. So that was a very exciting uh, fall uh, time for us. And in addition, I'm in the process of putting together uh, organic farm visits in the spring of this semester. So more to come on that. 
Uh, we are also uh, in charge of the Midwest Organic Poor Conference. Um, we've uh, launched it in 2019 and with COVID in 2020, we had to cancel, but we have partnered with Moses. So um, if you guys are up for it, uh, we will be there uh, this year. And we uh, are have a few of our organic pork farmers that will be presenting there. Of course, on farm field days, webinars that you're part of right now uh, are part of our education. As far as outreach, we connect with target audiences and public to promote research events and resources that are beneficial to organic community. Our website has a plethora of information uh, to include, you know, a variety of events in other organizations that, that uh, uh, you know, support the organic movement. Of course, we have social media pages. If you don't follow us, please do so, YouTube and so on and so forth. As far as advocacy, we try to advance state level leadership policies dedicated to funding uh, and supporting Iowa's growing organic movement. Uh, last year, we met with uh, Secretary Neg uh, and proposed a few things that we would like them to accomplish and we're actually following up with him again this year. So more to come on that. And of course, you know, building a community to support each other is uh, one of our biggest priorities and, and you guys are part of it. And uh, thank you for, uh, to each and everyone for your support and um, thanks for being here today. As far as a resource, um, this uh, resource is uh, pretty invaluable. It's, it's called our IO Organic Resource Directory. It's a document that is available on our website via PDF format, or you can actually even request it in a hard copy. I'd be happy to ship it your, your way. Um, it has about 900 different businesses, nonprofits, educators, and service providers that are uh, you know, there to support uh, the organic folks. So um, a very good resource for you to have if you don't already have. Um, and please connect with me if you want a, a paper copy. And then, of course, as a nonprofit organization, we rely heavily on your support. Um, if you'd like to become a member or potentially a sponsor, please connect with myself or our executive director, Roz, and we would be happy to explore those, those options with you. And this is what I have for now. So uh, at this point, uh, Liz, you can take over if you'd like. Great, I'll go ahead and get my slides up. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. Uh, let's see here. This is always the hardest part of the presentation, right? Getting yeah, yeah. Your slides going. All right, let's see if I can share now. Okay. Can you see them? Are we good to go? Yes, they, I, I can see them. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, so Olga, thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a soil microbiologist with the Soil Health Institute. And while the Institute is headquartered in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, I'm actually based here in central Iowa. I live in Nevada, Iowa, uh, and then I have office space in the agronomy department at Iowa State. So. If you're looking to ask some questions afterwards in person, uh, you can usually find me milling around uh, the Iowa State campus. So just a little bit of uh, about, a little background about the Soil Health Institute. Uh, the Institute was founded in 2015 with the mission to safeguard and enhance the vitality and productivity of soil through scientific research and advancement. And so just a little bit about who we are. Uh, we're a team of scientists, of biogeochemists, pedologists, physical soil scientists, microbiologists like myself. And then in addition to that, we also have uh, agronomists and economists on our team because we know that you know there's not just one facet to soil health that needs to be addressed at this point in time. Uh, a little bit of a shameless plug, uh, we are looking for a project manager to hire. Uh, the details on that can be found on our website. Uh, so if you are interested in joining our team, uh, it's a great place. Uh, this picture here was uh, from when we were all last together at uh, the annual Tri Society meetings out in Salt Lake City. So we're, we're a small but growing team. 
All right, and so no good soil health presentation is ever complete without the NRCS definition of what soil health is. So that definition being the capacity of a soil to function is a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And I underlined, underlined that word function there because that's what you know we tend to think about, what's our soil able to do? And so that function is kind of depicted in this picture below where we see these two fields that are managed differently, you know, same soils, same climates, but we can see just from the picture that they're not, you know, really able to function the same. We see ponding on the left, um, any action there. So this kind of brings up the first big question, uh, common question, you know, that we hear as far as regarding soil health. And that's, you know, what do we measure? So I think, you know, most of you are all aware of over the past few decades, there's been a ton of different measurements that have come out by private labs uh, and also research institutions as far as trying to get at that change in function from our changes in practices. Um, the second question that I'm planning on addressing today is, so after we figure out what to measure, how do we interpret those measurements? Uh, you know, we often hear that we can't treat soils the same in Iowa as we do in New York. So. How do we actually go about those interpretations to know that you know, your management practices are leading you on that right track? And then the big, uh, big one for today that I'll spend the second half of the presentation on is you know, after these management practices are adopted, we know that they're improving soil function. Are they economically viable? Uh, and what are the ramifications of adopting these practices? So to answer that first question, uh, we conducted, the Institute conducted a, a huge study uh, started in 2019 with the goal of identifying the most effective indicators of soil health. And to do this, we evaluated uh, over 30 different uh, common indicators of soil health on long-term agricultural research sites across the US, Canada, and Mexico. And the map on the right shows the location of those those 124 sites. Uh, so really a great spread of you know, climates and inherent soil properties. Um, and then these sites were picked uh, based on the comparison of different management practices. So they either had uh, paired tillage trials, cover crop, cover cropping trials, organic amendment trials, uh, residue management trials, or uh, differences in crop rotations. So after all these sites were picked out, uh, the Institute brought in a team of scientists uh, with different various backgrounds to pick out the measurements that uh, we would test on these soils that we collected uh, from all of these different locations. So I'm not gonna go through everything that we measured today, but just wanted to kind of give you know, a quick overview to show how we've been kind of thinking about grouping some of these different indicators. Um, so the first being, you know, related to carbon, uh, either carbon storage or carbon cycling. Uh, the second being related to nitrogen storage or nitrogen cycling. We know that those are, you know, go hand in hand or, and are very important. Um, and then the third big kind of main category is um, the influence on uh, water holding capacity. So, you know, soil structure and how that plays in. So how how some of these different changes uh, can affect soil structure and your available water content. Uh, and then finally, I'm not gonna get too into it or not gonna get into it today, but we are also uh, looking at some more kind of non-traditional measures of soil health that take into uh, different um, microbial community aspects. Uh, most are DNA based. Um, we also have uh, phospholipid fatty acids and enzyme activity that are listed there. So more to come on that, we're still kind of working our way through those and seeing, you know, if we can de determine some viable indicators out of those groups. But for today, I'll go over, just briefly go over some of the uh, findings that we found from those that are, you know, kind of uh, already in use by uh, private labs and uh, others in the soil health community. So when thinking about uh, the criteria of evaluating all of these di different measurements, we came up with kind of three main things that, you know, we want to consider uh, before recommending any of these measurements. Um, and the first is that the measurements are conceptually linked to these different ecosystem services. Uh, so whether that be you know, reductions in erosion, uh, increases in plant available water, uh, increases in uh, soil organic matter that can lead to increases in available nutrients for plants, and crops, um, but we want it 
wanted to be, you know, linked to some of these different services uh, rather than just saying, you know, okay, more is better uh, when we look at the measurement. So secondly, we wanted uh, these measurements to be responsive to changes in soil health management practices. So I listed the six before, um, but you know, obviously of interest probably to this group uh, would be response to organic amendments. Uh, it's a big one. Also, you know, reduced tillage, cover cropping, um, all of that good stuff. But you know, we want we want a measurable change. We want people to be able to see that you know um, their change in management is resulting. Uh, and a change in these measurable values. And then finally, one thing that we think about at the Soil Health Institute uh, that maybe some other researchers or scientists don't necessarily think about is, uh, are these measures cost effective? You know, uh, we, want, we want these measures to be able to uh, be widely applicable uh, to producers, to CCAs, to, you know, other stakeholders. Uh, so, you know, seeing if we can cut out maybe some of that redundancy and then also see, you know, are there ways where maybe we don't have to actually measure um, the actual indicator, maybe we can model it and that's good enough. Um, so thinking about that, trying to, you know, minimize the cost of uh, any one soil health indicator so we can maximize the test that uh, the producer would be available to afford. So I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of all the analyses that we ran um, uh, to try and decide you know, what some of these kind of best indicators were. Um, we've got lots of other talks on that um, and uh, I'd be happy to share with anybody if there's questions afterwards, um, but just to kind of go through the four that you know, we find are kind of really important. Uh, we'll do that briefly today. Uh, and I'll show some of these results as far as uh, their interpretations um, as we move forward. So the first measurement that uh, we like to look at is soil organic carbon. Um, it's a major component of uh, soil organic matter, um, but we like to measure this uh, instead of organic matter is that it is a bit more reproducible of a measurement. Um, and then also too, I know that there's, you know, a lot of interest in these evolving uh, carbon markets. So if you do, you know, if you are interested in those, it's kind of a win-win, um, but to think about measuring soil organic carbon instead of that organic matter. Um, the second uh, measurement that you may have heard of uh, called uh, more generally uh, soil respiration, uh, we call it potential carbon mineralization, a bit more of a mouthful, uh, but this is looking at a, a microbial response to rewetting. So you take a, uh, a a bit, or, you know, a handful of soil, a known amount, um, you air dry it and sieve it, uh, and then re-wet it with a known amount of water. And you're measuring that carbon dioxide that's kind of, uh, that's uh, given off is those microbes are, uh, are uh, responding to that, that moisture and activity. Um, so it's really kind of, you know, looking at uh, those microbes ability um, to use that soil or get organic carbon pool that's there um, and uh, perform all those different things that we know are so beneficial uh, to the soil. And it's also, uh, it's generally pretty highly related to microbial biomass. So it's uh, a bit cheaper uh, and less time consuming than measuring uh, your exact microbial biomass. So it gives an indication of the size and activity of that community. Let's see here. Another measurement uh, that we're excited about is uh, uh, aggregate stability. Uh, and so aggregate stability can be measured in a, a number of different ways. That in general, uh, we think of it as the fraction of, uh, of aggregates that remain after being exposed to a wetting event or a mechanical disturbance. So there's been a slew of different aggregate stability tests that have been out there for, I would say, over the last 80 years or so. Um, so we evaluated four different ones, and we've kind of come up with this one method that's really neat uh, that uses uh, image recognition of rewetted aggregates. So basically what we're doing is uh, you take uh, a few air-dried aggregates, uh, and then you place them in a, a dish of tea tree water. And then after 10 minutes, you're looking at that change. Ooh, I don't think I had the... There we go, there's the video. Uh, the change in that, in that uh, overall size of that aggregate. So your more stable aggregates, you know, you wouldn't see that big of a change in size. Um, 
But so this is really exciting. We think that this technology uh, can be available for use at commercial labs for somewhere between five and 10 bucks uh, per sample. So really being able to scale this one up cheaply. Uh, and then uh, finally, the last uh, measurement that I'm going to talk about today is uh, plant available water. Uh, so this can be measured directly on intact soil cores, but unfortunately, a lot of different private labs at this moment uh, in time, they don't offer this service. Uh, it is quite time consuming to measure this, but luckily, uh, uh, my uh, co-worker Diana Bagnall has developed a uh, a uh, what we call a pedotransfer function or um, a model which uh, utilizes uh, your soil organic carbon content, which we're already measuring, and then also uh, your soil texture. And based on that, uh, we can predict that plant available water with uh, pretty high confidence. So the figure on the right, uh, it shows uh, your soil silt content on the X axis and then your predicted available water on the y-axis uh, as far as millimeters per 100 uh, millimeters of, uh, of soil. And so with that, we see that there's these four lines and these four lines uh, show are indicative of four different soils uh, with increasing soil organic carbon content. So as those lines get higher, uh, we see that you know, we have a higher water holding capacity um, but we also noticed that, you know, this relationship isn't linear with silt. So um, within the next couple of months, we hope to have um, this function turned into an app on our website. So you can go in, uh, enter in um, your soil texture data, and then also your organic carbon data, and, uh, you know, uh, have computed out for you that predicted change in water holding capacity. So that, that's pretty neat, I think. So now we kind of have an idea of what to measure. You know, that next big question is, uh, how, what do we compare it to? You know, um, we could compare the two fields that are, uh, you know, in this picture on these different fence lines. But we know, you know, uh, we may know that, you know, the one on the left uh, will show higher uh, relative um, uh, measures of these different indicators that we described, but we don't know exactly how good that, that uh, soil on the left is, or how good it can be, right? You know, so uh, we've had um, a lot of back and forth with different stakeholders and the scientific team. And we've really kind of centered on developing a, a soil health reference state system for different farmers and stakeholders. Uh, so you can, you know, know where you are on your journey uh, compared to farmers with uh, similar climates and similar soil properties. So to do this, uh, a, a few scientists at the uh, Soil Health Institute, uh, they came up with a national soil grouping. They completed this uh, earlier in uh, 2021. And so we grouped soils uh, for 33 different states. Um, and so what you'll notice in, in the map here on the right side of the page is the similar colors are gonna be the similar soils uh, that have similar climates. Um, so you'll, you'll notice that, you know, it's not, you know, it's not cookie cutter, right? You know, some are intertwined more than others. Um, so to develop these kind of these different groupings um, to test this theory of, you know, having a reference state uh, or target soil of a, you know, a, per, a perennial high functioning system, we grouped these soils into four different, or used to kind of four different um, measures to group these soils uh, to put them into similar categories. Um, the first being soil texture, uh, the second being soil uh, drainage class, uh, the third being uh, your soil's mineralogy, uh, and then finally climate, like I had mentioned. Um, and so this has created all these different groupings. Um, we're going out now uh, to some different parts of the country and uh, testing this theory and seeing, you know, um, do these different groupings work? Can we combine maybe some of these groupings if they're performing similar? Um, and then really, you know, does this theory of, you know, working towards the soil health target um, within these given regions, you know, do we see changes towards the positive? And it turns out we do. 
so this is a, kind of a, a neat example. Um, these soils are actually uh, out in, uh, I believe, Pendleton, Oregon. Um, we were collected in 2019 as part of our big project. But um, so what you'll notice is the soil, the soil on the left uh, is a conventionally managed uh, system, um, frequent, uh, you know, yearly tillage, um, no cover crops, just kind of, we, we coin it as that kind of business as usual. Uh, and then the picture on the right is that is a um, is an unmanaged uh, perennial um, grass system. It's uh, been there for I believe about the last I, don't, I think twelve or thirteen years now. And so what you'll see in the middle here um, are the kind of ranges of these different measurements that we saw. So those bars on the left um, right are, they show what our measurements look like under those kind of business as usual conditions. Um, and then in the middle here, um, the, it's labeled regenerative agriculture, but these are, you know, your soil health management systems where um, at this site, they were employing um, reduced tillage, I believe no-till, and then also implementing cover crops. And so what we see is that, you know, these regenerative systems, these soil health management systems, they're kind of working towards that goal, that target on the right, that perennial managed uh, reference system. It, you know, is um, not losing uh, uh, different nutrients to either the air or through leaching. Um, it's efficiently building up soil organic carbon, um, all of that good stuff. So we can kind of see where we are on that path um, to that target. We realize that we'll probably never get to that perennial managed target, but I think there's a lot of innovative folks out there who are going to be pushing the, pushing the limits on that one. Uh, just a couple more examples of this, uh, a couple local examples, uh, since it is the Iowa Organic uh, Association today. Um, so these are similar figures, uh, that is, is what I showed on that last slide, um, but we have it broken up now by the three different measurements. So on the top there, that's that, you know, potential carbon mineralization or respiration. Uh, the middle of the graph shows that available water holding capacity or that, you know, uh, change in plant available water. And then finally, that uh, the differences in um, those uh, water stable aggregates that we measured. Uh, and so in the, the, um, the yellow dots, those represent our kind of, you know, business as usual cases, our, you know, conventional management. Um, the blue are the soil health management systems that are, are you know, employing uh, either, you know, reduced tillage, cover crops, organic amendments, uh, just to name a few. And then finally, those kind of dark green circles um, or those reference state samples. So those unmanaged perennial systems to give us an idea of, you know, where we are um, and where we can be. Um, and so what you'll notice is, uh, so if we just look at the, the top uh, part of the figure here, we have uh, four different locations uh, where we took these measurements. Um, and then, so that's on your, your y-axis there. So we have samples from, um, the Boone uh, Iowa State Agronomy Farm, uh, Neil Smith um, in, in Prairie City, Iowa, Horace, Kansas, uh, in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, so then on your x-axis, we have you, your, um, your, the circles, excuse me, represent your average respiration values, whereas uh, your bars represent those 95% confidence intervals. So saying how confident you are with that average. So the wider the bars, the less confident you are in the average, but the smaller the bars, the more confident you are. Um, so one of the things I would like to kind of have as a takeaway is to show that um, these dark green reference states, they're different um, in our different locations, right? So here in Horace, Kansas, you might not have that much room to grow or innovate as far as trying to reach that perennial system. But when we look at you know Prairie City um, and then also down in Columbia, Missouri, we've got you know room to grow as far as you know what we can do to try and reach those uh, those reference state values. And we see similar trends here uh, with the available water holding capacity um, and aggregate mean weight diameter. Um, and so you'll notice some overlap with the business as usual and soil health management systems, but. For the most part, we're seeing, you know, a trend towards those perennial reference systems. So kind of the next steps uh, for SHI uh, to see, you know, to kind of take this full scale. 
um, we've established these groupings based on you know our background in, uh, in soil science, but we're going out there now um, to measure and analyze this data um, as far as trying to get this up and running. Um, and we definitely welcome help. You know, we uh, we map these soils uh, using different um, uh, different layers that are available uh, through different programs. But we do know that you know farmers and uh, the producers and CCAs they know that the boots on the ground they definitely know it better than we do. So as we go out to try and you know develop some of these different groupings, we definitely love the feedback. Um, from from the actual producers um, and then hopefully you know as we start to get all of this data in we can make adjustments to the maps you know hopefully cut down on some of the some of the different groupings you know um, make it a little bit more simple to analyze um, so we've got uh, this has been employed so far in uh, Texas and uh, Arkansas and we're adding soils um, from I believe Georgia and Mississippi this year. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and we hope to eventually have all of this data uh, uh, added to our website. So you can go in, you can you know click on your region um, and you can you know figure out where other producers are around you, you know, as far as um, how these measurements look on their fields um, and figure out, you know, maybe what management strategy strategies they're employing to get. All right. So to kind of switch gears a little bit, you know, okay, so we've covered, you know, what to measure, how to interpret it, uh, you know, looking at this local reference state. So say, you you know, you think you're doing a good job, uh, you know, and you're seeing these benefits, these different ecosystem service benefits. So now we want to know, um, you know, is it viable economically as far as adopting these different soil health management systems or you know, maybe what should I target first? Uh, would it be reduced tillage? Would it be, uh, you know, introducing cover crops? Um, but, you know, what really works uh, for these folks who are already employing these different soil health systems? So to do this, um, uh, folks at the Soil Health Institute interviewed producers uh, from 100 different farms. And these farms uh, spanned uh, nine different states here. Uh, you can see highlighted in the green. Um, and so with these farmers that we uh, identified, um, we wanted it to be farmers who, you know, were a bit more established uh, in their role as far as um, a soil health management adoption. So I say five years here uh, on this slide, but on average is pretty neat across the board. Um, the producers had adopted on average 19 years of no-till. Um, and then nine years uh, on average of covered crop implementation. Um, and so it's no surprise within those nine states, we do see you know, bulk of the corn and soybean production in the United States, 71% of corn, 67% uh, of soybeans to be exact. Um, and then also kind of you know, just uh, 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 interesting to note and important takeaway is that you know, we did see quite a range of soil types and climates um, between these farmers where they were in these nine different states. Um, so we had, yeah, uh, mean annual precip precipitation ranging everywhere, uh, ranging from 20 inches to all the way to 55 inches. Um, and then a mean annual temperature, a little bit smaller, but um, from 43 degrees to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we can't forget to mention uh, that these farmer interviews and all of this data analysis um, wouldn't have been possible without uh, the generous support from Cargill to get this all done. So I know there's a lot to take in uh, on this table, but just wanted to point out a few different characteristics of, of the 100 farms um, that we looked at uh, across these different states. Um, so. The first thing you'll see is uh, the number of farms or number of uh, farms that we use for interviews in this data. Uh, they were pretty much evenly split up across those nine states. Uh, we did have a few more in Indiana um, than the other states, but every state had at least 10 farmers represented. Um, the majority of the acres um, that these uh, producers or farmers were um, looking at as far as the economic benefits they were primarily in corn and soybean production. 
Uh, we did have a bit of wheat production mixed in. Uh, and then also to point out, there was a bit of um, cotton production uh, from a couple of the farmers down in, uh, in Tennessee. But one, one nice thing to kind of take a look at is, you know, that last column there, that average crop acres. Um, what we really, you know, are seeing is that, you know, these aren't backyard operations. These are, you know, commercial operations with, you know, for the most part, thousands of acres um, that are being managed um, in these different systems. So pretty neat to see. I think that there's, you know, a lot that we can take away from some of these early adopters who've gotten uh, these different, or who've employed these different management systems for, you know, the past decade or two. Um, so, and just wanted to uh, give you all, since, you know, it, it, we are in Iowa today, um, just an, a little bit of an overview of the location and the crops for the 10 farms that were included in Iowa. Uh, so you'll see they were definitely uh, pretty well distributed across the state there. Um, and they definitely, they represent our different soil and climatic conditions that we have here in Iowa. Um, and what, what you'll notice too, uh, it kind of followed along, uh, this information was on the last slide, but um, the average acres uh, that were included um, in these Iowa results, uh, it was slightly more corn at just over 1200 uh, average acres being farmed um, with these different management practices and just under a thousand uh, with soybeans. Um, but it is, you know, kind of important to note that uh, here with this set of um, these 10 farms that the average size of these operations was above that national average. So, you know, really indicating that we can implement some of these different practices at scale. So here we have an overview of the different soil health management systems that were adopted uh, by these 100 farmers broken down by state. Uh, so on the y-axis here, we have this percent of uh, planted acres. So this was the average percent of planted acres, either on the left in no-till, uh, the percent of planted acres in reduced till in the middle, and then finally the percent of planted acres by state in cover crops on the left. And so what you'll, you'll notice is that, um, you know, on the left side here, we definitely see, um, we saw the highest adoption of, uh, of no-till of the management practices uh, that we looked at or, you know, talked about with um, the farmers in these interviews. And you'll notice that, you know, it ranges from about 54% all the way up to 100% of the planted acres uh, in Tennessee that were under no-till. Um, the last, uh, the three blue bars that are on uh, the right side of the groupings uh, re represent um, the U.S. national averages. So once again, you know, the, these farmers, they're, they're way ahead of the curve. I think there's a lot we could learn from them. Um, you know, they, they're all about it, but it is, you know, this is different, a bit different, you know, these are these long-term adopters that we'll be looking at the results for today. Um, one point of interest, uh, the You'll notice in, under the reduced till, we see higher numbers um, uh, in reduced till for Minnesota than the other states. Um, and what we kind of found through the interviews was that uh, in these Minnesota soils, uh, they were cooler and wetter soils compared to a lot of other ones that um, data was collected on in this project. And they were harder to adopt uh, no-till ineffectively. But a smattering of the farmers did find they were able to um, introduce uh, a reduced till system. So, so still, you know, working towards that um, that that right path there. Um, and then, you know, finally looking at um, the uh, adoption of cover crops. So it's uh, it's not where uh, the no-till is, but you know, if you look at that blue bar, uh, looking at that. 5% uh, average across the United States, whereas uh, on average in in this study, uh, just about over half of the farmers that were interviewed um, employed cover crops uh, on their acres. So the approach for figuring out um, the the benefits, the cost benefits of adopting these soil health management practices, uh, it's a bit different uh, than maybe something you might be used to as far as, you know, uh, compiling, say, an enterprise budget. Um, we 
we, instead of compiling enterprise budgets, we calculated these partial budgets where we are only looking to compare the benefits and costs from before and after that soil health management adoption practice, adoption of that practice. Um, so details, some specific details on these methods are listed on our website. Um, I'm happy to try and answer some questions as we move along into that period. Um, but you know, really just kind of honing in on those differences um, in adoption practices instead of you know trying to get after every receipt and things like that. Um, it is uh, important to note uh, that the revenue uh, calculated was used or uh, was calculated using a standardized uh, long-term uh, average uh, price set. And these prices uh, were developed by economists at uh, the University of Illinois. So, you know, if this is something that you wanted to do yourself, you could obviously go in and, you know, alter those prices uh, to something that, you know, may be more relevant to 2022 than 2019 um, when this work was initialized. And then finally, I uh, just want to point out that uh, USDA payments were not included in these analyses. Um, not that, you know, there's anything wrong with the payments. They do a great job of getting more acres, you know, into cover crops and things like that. Um, so just think about that as we move along that, you know, those payments that those will be on top of the results that I'm going to present to you here. All right. Time to get into the nitty gritty. So there's, there's a lot going on um, on, uh, on this slide. And this really is the crux of, you know, how these benefits were calculated. Uh, I'm going to stick today to looking at the benefits uh, and costs for corn and soybean systems. Um, there are, we do have results for wheat as well, but since the majority of the acres um, of the farmers that we interviewed were in corn and soybean, I thought that I would stick with these today. Um, so you'll notice, first of all, on, uh, on uh, the, your first column there, all the way on the left, we have these different categories that uh, represent some of these different costs uh, that are uh, associated with our different practices. So whether that be seed, fertilizers, um, the you know, fuel needed uh, to run equipment. Um, so all of those different things. Uh, so under, so just looking at the left side now, so if we look at corn, we have two columns under corn. We have a benefits and a cost. Uh, so under that, that benefits uh, column in the blue there, we have two different kind of categories within that. First, that reduction in expense. Um, so uh, after implementing the soil health management practice, what costs were we able to cut? And then below that, towards the bottom of the slide, we look at additional revenue. So based on after implementing uh, your soil health management practices, uh, what additional revenue um, did you see based on um, your different increases or, or you know, decreases in yield? Uh, and then, that second column there uh, with the red text, your costs there. Um, so those are gonna be additional expenses accrued from adopting your soil health management uh, practices. And then kind of similarly under that reduced revenue, we, take, we took into account where, you know, if the farmer did see uh, a hit on yield after adopting those practices. Um, so kind of look at a few of, you know, the different factors that kind of, you know, made up big parts of of these uh, changes in income. The first one we kind of look at is that cost to seed. Um, and so we do see uh, there is, you know, a, a definite additional cost of seed um, uh, that outweighs uh, the benefit of some of the reduced seed costs. Um, but this is mainly tied into planting those cover crops. Uh, and just to point out um, the cost of the cover crop uh, might seem low, but it's, it's, this is the average cost that was incurred across those 100 farmers. So with only about you know, half, of, uh, half of the farmers implementing cover crops, uh, we see that cost cut about in half. So if you're wondering why those costs were a little bit low, um, that, that's uh, probably the reason there. Um, Secondly, you know, thinking about fertilizer uh, and amendments. Um, so we do see benefits here for the most part um, in both corn and soybean, outweighing those, uh, those uh, few instances where we did see uh, having to apply more fertilizer um, or organic amendments. Um, 
And so what this is really, you know, kind of getting at here is that these soil health management practices are, uh, these producers are seeing gains in, uh, you know, uh, soil organic matter, uh, available nutrients for plant growth. Um, a lot of them are using, you know, 4R nutrient management strategies. So really kind of thinking about, you know, what's most effective, uh, you know, how they can cut it, but still be maintaining, you know, yield as it, as it was prior to um, changing over the management practices. Uh, we do see uh, also benefits in uh, savings in uh, fuel and electricity, and then also labor and service costs. And these here are mainly tied into um, reductions in tillage. So, you know, the, the uh, fewer passes you have to make in the field, the less fuel you're going to use, um, the, the less labor, uh, you know, is attributed to those extra passes in the fields. So that's kind of one of the big ones um, that we see here. And then also, you know, um, this uh, 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 changeover to no-till, it also, uh, ends up reducing um, the need to have extra equipment. So that equipment ownership, we see a benefit there. So, and then finally kind of getting down um, to those, uh, those additional uh, revenues or reduced revenues. Um, so overall, um, I believe it is, uh, we used um, an average corn price of uh, or $4.20 per uh, bushel per acre, and then uh, 10 bucks for the soybeans. Um, that was based on um, that work done at University of Illinois. Um, so with that being said, we did see, so overall uh, from these 100 farmers, 67% um, of them um, uh, said that uh, they saw increases in uh, their yield from employing these soil health management practices. So, you know, really looking at that benefit there. Um, and then, you know, overall we did, I think it was 2% of farmers saw a decrease in yield. So that's why we see the slight negative numbers there. Um, but kind of, you know, getting it all together, looking at overall those different uh, costs and benefits when we add them up, we saw the on average from these hundred farms, a net increase of $51.60 uh, for corn and then uh, $44.89 uh, per acre for soybean. So these were the averages, but I did just want to break out and show you that we did have a distribution of these farmers and where these, you know, uh, these increases in profitability are coming from. Um, so for corn, we did have 85% um, of farmers did uh, report an increase uh, in their profitability. Um, and we saw something pretty similar for soybean where we saw 88% of farmers uh, reporting that increase uh, with an average of 45 bucks per acre. Um, so you'll notice that, you know, the few farms on the left uh, that were reporting a slight negative decrease in farm income, um, these were some of our more early adopters. So those closer to that, you know, five-year implementation that might still be kind of working out the kinks on their farms. Um, you know, not, not everything is gonna work everywhere and not everybody is the same. Um, but then, so to contrast that on that left side, uh, we see these, you know, these really great benefits or, uh, and our great changes in net farm income. And what we found with a few of those is um, a few of these farmers were beginning to see, receive premiums for non-GMO crops. Um, as they changed over their practices, they were able to do that um, and implement those. So that's pretty neat to see. Um, just wanted to break it down to, uh, to show you that the change in net in farm income for the 10 Iowa farms kind of followed that same pattern uh, is those 100 farms uh, across the nine states. So, you know, some with, with great increases uh, and then also, you know, some that are, you know, seeing about, you know, 20 to $30 increase. Um, for, uh, based on corn. We did see uh, something similar uh, for the changes uh, in net farm income for soybeans. Uh, we did have, in Iowa have one farm where there is a slight decrease uh, in net farm income. This doesn't mean that this practice uh, isn't viable. It just means from what they had made before uh, prior to adoption of the soil health management practices that we were seeing uh, those reductions.
So then just wanted to show quickly. So if we say we take yield out of the equation, uh, this chart here shows the average decrease in production cost across those 100 farms from these different states. So what you'll notice, uh, you know, yield aside, just thinking about, you know, your changes in management operations, we see, you know, a change or an increase in profitability from eight bucks all the way up to Thirty-five dollars uh, per acre in Ohio there in uh, your corn production system. So you know that's it's kind of neat to see, even if you take yield out, and we are just looking at you know those other parts of your management system. Um, we do still see those benefits of the soil health management practices. Um, and then just real briefly here, uh, wanted to show. Uh, that we had a, a questionnaire um, that was given out to the farmers that we interviewed. And most of them saw other uh, benefits um, other than yield as far as things were, were important um, for uh, when they changed over to these soil health management systems. Um, so this ranged from you know, increases in crop resilience uh, to improved water quality, uh, increases in soil organic matter, uh, reduced fertilizer input. So, Lots of other good things coming along um, with these differences, uh, other than just you know the economic benefits. So in summary, uh, for this economics part, uh, on average, the average farm size was uh, you know just shy of two thousand acres. So these are real production systems. Uh, on average, uh, soil health management uh, reduced production costs by twenty-four dollars per acre of corn and seventeen dollars per acre of soybean. Uh, and then kind of looking back at that too, we saw that, you know, uh, soil health management practices increased net farm income for 85% of farmers in corn and just slightly more with 88% growing soybean. Uh, these management practices, you know, if we do look at overall average net farm income, uh, we see a bit more of a gain. Uh, we see $52 per acre for corn and 45 for soybean. Um, and so this is attributing, you know, that 67% of farmers who did see that yield increase um, with the adoption of those practices. Um, and then, you know, the, just talked about it, but there are these, you know, additional benefits that were reported by farmers. Um, you know, a couple, two really important ones uh, that were really high were, you know, they, they uh, noted that they reported increases uh, and increased access to their fields. Um, and that, you know, that usually falls, uh, Resilient with resilience to extreme weather events. You know, we want to be able to get in after these crazy weather events. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so uh, to kind of wrap it up, uh, based on these current adoption rates, uh, you know, and what we found, um, we think that, you know, more farmers can apply these things um, and increase uh, the overall profitability. So an overall summary, um, you know, we like to think about when picking out soil health indicators, uh, pick them based on the soil functions that you're looking at, you know, uh, avoid redundancy with that. Um, and secondly, you know, we're working uh, to use these reference state soils to know what is achievable, you know, so what you can kind of expect after implementing some of these practices. And then finally, with this great study um, uh, sponsored by Cargill, uh, you know, it's these uh, soil health management practices, at least in the Midwestern Corn Belt, we found that they are overall economically viable. Um, so with that, I would like to thank uh, Archie Flanders. Uh, he's our lead economist uh, at the Soil Health Institute. Uh, and then also John Shanahan, who helped him uh, conduct a lot of uh, the different farmer interviews uh, to collect the data that went into um, to producing those uh, this partial budget analyses. Um, and then finally, I have to thank all of our different funders. So Cargill, uh, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, General Mills, and the Walton Foundation. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you for attending today and I'd be happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Liz, for this wonderful presentation and all of the amazing research that you guys are conducting. Um, there are some questions that have come in. Feel free to uh, unshare your presentation if you'd like. Um, so the first question is, thank you for sharing your seminal work. Are there emerging soil practices specifically explored to mitigate climate change? Sure. Yeah, I think that that... Um is a, 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 a timely topic. Um, we are, so we have a different project at the Institute going on to see how, um, how different um, organic uh, manure applications 
uh, are affecting um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that that's one, you know, I think that there's a lot of different uh, stuff out there in the literature uh, that I've seen from my perspective that show that some of these management practices either can, you know, increase it or reduce it. So um, we have this great uh, nine state uh, wide project uh, going on with different dairy farmers. So hopefully um, that'll be some information that I can share with you all in the future here with the awesome. Organic Association. Wonderful. Dr. Dellett is asking, do you have any data from organic farms since herbicides are used in conventional no-till and they are disallowed in organic? It'd be really good to include some organic farms as a comparison to show soil quality without herb herbicides. Sure. Yeah, I believe there was, I think maybe one or two involved in this study. Um, but that was kind of hard because uh, we had, you know, we wanted the practices to be in line for at least five years. And we know there's some great organic uh, innovators out there. Um, but yes, I think that that's another great step. Um, we are working with folks, not necessarily in the corn belt right now, but in the cotton belt to look at differences between, you know, uh, how that organic, you know, having to till in an organic system, how that would affect, um, you know, your soil organic matter. And, some of those different properties. Um, but, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Do you have the reduced till groupings of interviewed farms parsed out to identify amount of strip till versus other practices? Uh, not so. Not how uh, the results, the economic results, were calculated in this. So when I showed those figures, they were all grouped in together there. So you might. You know, that would be something interesting to do is to kind of, you know, parse those out and see if, you know, you were seeing extra benefits of the no-till. Um, I think you would probably see a little bit more of a price increase, right? So if you aren't having to pay for, you know, a modified tillage uh, application, you know, if you are just, you know, switching over to that no-till drill, um, it would probably, you know, feed back into a higher uh, profit, I would say. Okay. Uh, the other question is, I wonder if in Kansas-like climate, soils, um, the base perennial ideal is either not actually an ideal system for the goals or other added soil indicators would we be more useful? Sure, yeah, and that's something that we've been really thinking about for um, different, so Kansas and then also different regions in Texas, you know, so we're, we're thinking about those highly functioning systems and so it also you know say like a, up in the northeast where you have um you know the soils were um were forests before right you know it wasn't these perennial managed grasslands um so we are taking that into account we're thinking about you know maybe irrigated pasture is kind of that upper limit um as far as reference states and some of these more arid climates um, to be continued for that. We're, we're working with this first set of data that we're getting back and adjusting and seeing as we go. Indeed. Uh, the other suggestion was uh, maybe including uh, the um, not losing soil off the farm into your research. Yeah, so I think so that really getting at that uh, Aggregate measure of aggregate stability. So there's been a lot of great researchers who have linked those measures of aggregate stability to um, these measures of reduced erosion or increased infiltration. So that's one that we really like to emphasize if you know, you're know you trying to hone down on what you wanna measure. Um, we really like to support that one. Okay. Uh, uh, Steven with PFI says, nicely done Liz, thanks for this work and for sharing it today. I especially appreciate the use of the reference site in order to to contextualize what is possible soil health wise locally. Um, Leon said, could you comment on quantifying improved the land value on balance sheet from soil health, health improvements? Yeah, I think the first place where, you know, we've seen a lot of this chatter, I think a lot of you have is in soil carbon markets, right? You know, but I think as we move along that, uh, you know, some of these other measurements that aren't necessarily, that are maybe more associated with management that do kind of get more at, you know, your soil structure and things like that. I think we will start to see, you know, some standardization and, you know, monetary benefits associated with these things. That's our goal, at least. 
Awesome. Yes, that, that, that would be amazing. Linda um, says, do you, how do you find the reference soils for our area? Is there a link on your website? Uh, so we are we are working on creating uh, these reference soils for all across the country. Um, so we're kind of working on validating that right now. I would say if you are eager and this is something that you know you want to go out and test uh, yourself, uh, one thing that you can do is so if you have you know any unmanaged perennial systems around uh, your operation that's you know fairly close, uh, I would say that that would be a good place to start. Um, you know we're really working with the the, the mapping units things right now to take into account um, soil texture and things like that. So if you have, you know, a good background of knowledge of, you know, some of these different characteristics of your farm, um, I would say, you know, work on grouping those together at first. Um, and then if you aren't, you know, maybe necessarily around an unmanaged perennial system, um, take an undisturbed uh, soil sample from your farm, you know, whether that be say, you know, something that's been in a grass waterway for the past 15 years or, you know, a, a fence line sample where, you know, the soil hasn't been so over disturbed. Um, so I would say that that's a, a good first place to start and stay tuned uh, as we develop, you know, these more robust groupings uh, for bigger areas of land. Yeah, yeah. And finally, um, I'll finish on uh, Dr. Dellett's suggestion, which I agree with completely. She said, IOA, us, we could provide names of organic farms that have a range of histories of up to 60 years of organic. That is true. And she said, additionally, we at ISU have five to 24 year old organic sites we'd be happy to have sampled. That sounds great. Yeah. That, um... I'm sorry, who, who, that's who was Dr. that? That's Dr. Dellett, Kathleen Dellett at Iowa. Okay. Well, maybe we can get in contact afterwards. That, that sounds fantastic. Yes. Yes, indeed. I can I can provide you Dr. Dellett's contact information list. And Audrey says, excellent presentation, information. Thank you so much for the amazing work and resources. And I agree with that. Um, we'll kind of wrap it up since we're right at one o'clock here, but Dr. Uh, Liz, thank you so much for your amazing research and we look forward to additional research, hopefully to include some of those organic uh, farms that we mentioned. But yeah, this was, this was amazing. So thank you for all of your hard work and um, for everyone that attended you guys, uh, I will be uh, sharing a link uh, to the recording on our YouTube channel, as well as a quick survey. It'll take about five minutes or so for you to fill out it helps us understand how we can uh, serve you uh, better in the future and what kind of programming, programming we can provide moving forward. Um, in the meantime, thanks everyone again for being here today. And Dr. Liz, thanks again. Uh, this was very, uh, a lot of information, very amazing. And I'll have to rewatch uh, to <laughs> get it all, <laughs> get it all back again. But yeah, um, thanks guys. And um, have a great day, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. It was great to be a part of. Of course. Thank you. Bye-bye.